Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the John Campia Podcast. I am, of course, John Campia. Thank you for visiting my movie vlog today on this early Tuesday morning. We've got a whole bunch of stuff to talk about today, and here's how today is going to run. I have picked out six questions that you guys have sent in to me. Now, how do you get a question on the John Campia Podcast? It's simple. Just email me anytime at the John Campia podcast at gmail.com. That's the John Campia podcast at gmail.com. Send on in your questions, your topics, your point of view, whatever. Maybe you'll see it pop up on the show. You can look in the description of this video. You'll see the questions laid out there. And after that, we're going to talk a little bit about some other stuff. So anyway, without any further ado, let's jump into it with question number one. And question number one today comes to us from Cameron Drost, who writes... Hey, John, love what you're doing with the show. Thank you so much. As most of us comic book nerds know, Storm is Black Panther's wife, and we got two different versions of Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver in the MCU and X-Men Days of Future Past, if you saw the Rogue Edition. My question is, do you think we would get an MCU version of Storm? Well, thanks a lot for the question, uh, Cameron. And, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I actually believe that in the comics, Storm and Black Panther are no longer married. Like, their marriage got annulled, I believe. Uh, T'Challa annulled their marriage like, just a couple of years into it after a big incident involving the X-Men and, you know, some big damage done to Wakanda and stuff like that. And he said, nah, take off, you're out of here. Anyway, it ended the marriage. There weren't, I remember at the time, there were a bunch of people who weren't really happy with the fact that they paired off Storm and T'Challa. Like a lot of people said, they just decided it, that the, you know, the creators over Marvel just decided to do it. There was no natural chemistry between them. A lot of people complained that it felt a little bit forced, but a lot of people thought they were one of the best power couples ever in comic book history at the same time. So there were really opinions on both sides of the spectrum as far as how much they liked their pairing uh, at the same time. But a couple of years later, they very quietly, very quickly, very expeditiously ended the marriage and they moved them on and they never went on to explain anything really. But anyway, that happens in comic books because you got a thousand storylines going on at once in your universe. So I get that. So anyway, but the question, but they were married and they were a very cool couple. I mean, I remember that one cover of Black Panther was one of the coolest comic book covers I had ever seen. It's just like T'Challa sitting there on his throne and Storm looking very regal standing beside him and stuff like that. It was a very cool image. One of the, actually, like I Said, well, I think one of the best comic book covers ever in history. I really love that damn thing. But whether or not people loved or hated the whole T'Challa and Aurora uh, matchup, it, it didn't really matter because in the movie universe, you can't have them together. Black Panther is in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Storm is in the Fox Cinematic Universe. Now, what Cameron is asking is, is a question that gets brought up a lot about the different characters in Fox and Marvel. And the basis is always this. to say, well, look, they had you know, uh, Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch, both in the Fox universe and in the Marvel universe. So can we use this character in both? And can we use that character in both? So why can't we use this character in both? Here's the thing. Uh, Joss Whedon and Kevin Feige were both asked about this once before, about, you know, the deal and all that kind of stuff that got both Scarlet Witch and uh, Quicksilver in both universes. And what they said was very clear. This is what they said. In the scope of the deal, like between Fox and Marvel, those two characters, they said, were the only two characters that can exist in both worlds. They were very clear when they said that. that. I mean, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but the message was, this is it. I mean, there are no characters in crossover with one exception, and that's the sibling pair of Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch. Fox can use them, and Marvel can use them. And the asterisk besides that is that Fox can use them, without ever mentioning anything to do with the Avengers or things like that, Marvel can use them, but if Marvel uses them, they can make no reference to mutants, and obviously Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch are mutants, but they can make no reference to mutants, they can make no reference to their father, who is, of course, Magneto and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, they were very clear. So in the question of, can Fox and Marvel both use a Storm character so we could see Black Panther marry Storm in the MCU? The answer to that is, as the deals exist right now, the answer to that is no. And I don't think that's going to change. Look, it's one thing for Deadpool 
and Fox to make deals with Marvel to take a character that Marvel probably wasn't going to use anyway and say, okay, you go ahead and use that. And, you know, you can use the power set of this person here and that's all fine. But it's another issue entirely to say, let us have a character that is an existing ongoing character in our universe. And you also use the character as an existing ongoing character in the universe and everything. No, that's a different situation altogether. Fox, I do not believe, would ever give up Storm's rights to go over there, and they would not want Marvel to have a version of Storm in the MCU while Fox has their version of Storm in the MCU. And of course, they're recreating that as we speak. So I just don't see it happening. That doesn't mean it can't ever happen that at some point Fox, maybe Fox decides, you know what, we're just not going to use the Storm character anymore. So I'll tell you what, Marvel, you give us something good. We'll stop using Storm and then you can have Storm. I mean, that's possible, unlikely, but possible. But the whole notion of them extending the deal so that Storm could be both in the Fox universe and the Marvel Cinematic Universe... I just don't see that happening anytime soon. I just don't think it's something that Fox would be interested in. I honestly don't think it's something that Marvel would be interested in either. All right, now moving on to our next question. This one comes to us from Edwin Taylor. And Edwin Taylor writes, I'm not from the U.S., yet I disagree with Luc Besson's assessment of Captain America being U.S. propaganda and have to wonder whether he's seen the movies. Cap's rallying against a propaganda role thrust upon him early and his faith in authority diminishes so much that he divides the Avengers in two, a poignant mirror of ideological divisions in the U.S. today. What are your thoughts on the Luke Besson's comments? Thanks a lot for the question, Edwin. And this is a big one. This one, I, I've kind of been sitting quiet about this for the last 24 hours or so. But I gotta tell you, this one really bothers me. For those of you who do not know what we're talking about, Luc Besson, who, for the most modern film, Luc Besson is the director of, of Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets, right? So, Luc Besson was just doing an interview recently. And by the way, Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets is going to end up being the biggest bomb uh, of the year in terms of how much money it loses the studio. It's going to lose the studio in the hundreds of millions of dollars. People are losing their jobs over this movie. People are going to go bankrupt over this movie. I didn't think the movie was terrible. I actually thought there was enough uh, imagination in it that it made it worth it, but it was nowhere near as good as I was hoping. I was this close to giving it a negative review. But overall, I thought there was enough imagination and creativity, even though the dialogue is horrible and the script isn't very good. Anyway, so he was being interviewed uh, while promoting his film. And Luc Besson decided to jump on the bandwagon and do this big bashing of the entire comic book genre, number one, but number two of Captain America specifically claiming that Captain America is nothing but a propaganda machine. Okay, look, as look, here's his actual words. This is what Luc Besson had to say in the interview, talking about when asked about the comic book movie genre and things like that. This is what he said. I'm totally tired of it. Totally. I mean, it was great 10 years ago when we saw the first Spider-Man and Iron Man. Now it's like number five, six, seven. The superhero is working with another superhero, but it's not the same family. I'm lost. Really, Luke? You're lost? I tell you what, I got a bunch of seven and eight year olds I know who watch the DCEU and the MCU, and they have no problem whatsoever following these super complex storylines that seem to have you lost. I'll introduce you to these children and maybe they can catch you up to speed. But anyway, let's move on. He goes on to say even more stupid shit. Here's what he had to say. What bothers me most is that it's always here to show the supremacy of America and how they are great. I mean, which country in the world would have the guts to call a film Captain Brazil or Captain France. I mean, no one. We would be so ashamed and say, no, no, come on, we can't do that. They can. They can call it Captain America and everybody thinks it's normal. Uh, Luke, you, you do know that they didn't just out of nowhere say, hey, let's make a movie and call it Captain America. Like you, you do know that Captain America is a character who's been around for decades and decades and decades and decades and the circumstances of which the character was created in the first place decades and decades and decades ago. Like, you do understand that. You do also know there are characters like Captain Britain and various superheroes around the world have nationalistic associations, right? Like, you do understand that. You're an intelligent man, right? Now, here's the thing. I'm all for even filmmakers 
having an opinion about something that's not their own movies. Although I think you got to be really careful when talking about other people's movies when you yourself are a filmmaker, that you work in the Hollywood film industry, that you put out big wide release films. I think you got to be careful about talking about other people who are doing the same because, you know, glass houses and all that sort of thing. But the thing that really bothered me was the fact that the motivation of him bashing an entire genre of films came in this next quote from the same interview. Listen to this. I'm not here for propaganda. I'm here to tell a story. So obviously the implication here is Joss Whedon, Zack Snyder, Patty Jenkins, the Russo brothers, all these directors who've poured blood, sweat, and tears of storytelling and their passion and their talent into films over decades of years. They're, they're not story. They're not here to tell stories. Those guys, they're all assholes. They're not here to tell stories. I, I, the artist, I am here to tell a story. They're not in the story. Those guys are losers. They're not storytelling business. Shut up, asshole. And Valerian is another proposal different, where you really travel. You meet aliens a lot, and there are real themes. I mean, Valerian and Loreline are not superheroes. They're not even heroes. They're people just like you and me. They're cops. They do their job, but sometimes they can be heroic. That's what I love, because I can relate to that. I can't relate to a superhero. I don't have superpowers. And there it is. That's it. Luc Besson just really revealed what it was that he's really bitching and moaning and complaining about. Now, before I go on too much, let me say, Luc Besson has made some incredible films. He's made some wonderful films. He's made some stinkers, but hey, everybody has. But he's made some incredible films. And I believe his legacy for the films he has created in the past are totally safe and secure from any stupid, dumb shit that he says moving forward. However, that doesn't mean he doesn't say stupid, dumb shit. And he has said some really stupid, dumb shit here. But Luc Besson tips his hand here. What this is really about is not whether or not guys like Zack Snyder, Patty Jenkins, the Russo brothers, Joss Whedon, Kenneth Branagh, who directed a superhero film in the first Thor, like all these people. It's not whether or not they're storytellers or whether he's the only real storyteller. What comes down to it here is you've got a guy, a filmmaker, who's incredibly butthurt over the fact that this movie, which has been his passion project for decades, sucked and was a massive bomb. Now, how can I say it sucked? I already said, I, yeah, yeah, I, I, I did. But man, that movie bombed and a lot of people hated it. A lot of people thought it was very creative. I thought it was very creative in its imagination and its concept. But he's butthurt that this movie, which needed to make around $400 million to break even, this is a movie that needed to make about $400 million to break even when you take into consideration the theater's cut, the marketing costs, and the production costs all together. You're talking about $400 million you need to make. Worldwide, as of right now, the movie's made $90 million. So yeah, do the math. You're talking about a film that's going to lose over $300 million. And now you've got this filmmaker who, instead of taking responsibility for the failure, say, you know what? <clears throat> Put a lot of years of my life into making this. I wish it had turned out better. I wish we could have delivered an experience that more fans appreciated. Uh, and it didn't work out. But you know what? I'm excited about my future films. Instead of doing that, he decides to try to find escape. He goes, my movie is, I'm a real storyteller. These bullshit comic book movies. Are, you know what? <clears throat> I'm sorry, Basan. You could have maybe gotten away with making a statement like this. And I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of Luke Basan. But you could have gotten away maybe with making a statement ba about this back in the Batman and Robin days with bat nipples and crap like that. You maybe could have gotten away with that back in the day of Superman fighting for nuclear, you know, trying to get rid of nuclear weapons in the world and fighting nuclear man and all this kind of stuff. Maybe you could have gotten away with it then. But you're living in an age now where we have films like... X-Men Days of Future Past, where we have films like Logan, where we have films like Wonder Woman, where we have films like The Dark Knight, where we have films like The Avengers, where we have films like Civil War. We're living in an era now where there are some really awesome comic book movies being made. And the fact that you get so publicly ass hurt about that genre just so happens right on the eve of the fact that your own movie, which you think is the only true, really good movie out there, is bombing so insanely hard, comes across as incredibly petty and incredibly disingenuous. I'm a big fan. You're always going to be a hero to me as far as how good of a filmmaker you are. But that doesn't protect you from getting called out on your shit. And this was stupid shit. I can't wait to see your next movie. But what you're talking about is bullshit. You sound like an asshole. So maybe just shut your mouth and stop whining about other films 
films that are doing it right and being successful at it and the fans are embracing and loving and maybe focus more of your attention on taking that horrible piece of shit script that was Valerian in the City of a Thousand Planets. Like I get your big concept and the big concept was great, but as the director of the film, you accepted a piece of shit script and pieces of shit dialogue and you made that movie. So maybe, maybe instead of spending your time and your energy complaining about people who are doing it right and succeeding, maybe you should focus more of your attention on making your own films better so fans like them more. Hey, just a thought. Ooh, I went off on that for a little while. Um, anyway, let's get back to it and get back to the questions. And the next question today comes to us from San, well, I'm going to butcher this, Sandeep Srivastava, who writes, hey, John, big fan. Thank you so much, Sandeep. My question is, whatever happened to the sequel to The Prince of Persia, Sands of Time? As far as video game movies go, it wasn't bad. I liked it and feel it's an underappreciated video game movie. Could you share some of your thoughts? Thanks a lot for the question, Sandeep. Um, here's the thing about Prince of Persia, Sands of Time. Now, all film is subjective. If you enjoyed it and you liked it, that's awesome. I celebrate that. I'm never going to try to talk you out of liking it. Um, but I will tell you, since you're asking me, I thought the movie was quite bad. It was a poor film. As far as whatever happened to the sequel, well, here's what happened to the sequel. The movie lost money. That's what happened to the sequel. And remember, today, it's still like, it's rare that you hear about a film costing $200 million. I mean, a bunch of the superhero films do, sure, but it's not often you hear. It's not every day and every week you hear about a movie being $200 million. Imagine back in 2010 when this movie came out. This movie costs $200 million just in production budget alone. That's a huge chunk of change, especially for then. This movie needed to make a hell of a lot of money. And it did make a lot of money. I mean, $336 million, I think, the movie made worldwide. But that was not nearly enough to break even. The movie lost money. The movie was also panned and rejected by audiences and critics alike. They didn't like the film. So if your first film is disliked by audience and critics and it lost money, why would you believe if you're a studio executive, why would you believe that, oh, if I make another one, it'll make more money? No, it'll make less money because the people didn't like the first one the first time out. <clears throat> and look, this isn't any sort of a, um, a proclamation on the performance of Jake Gyllenhaal or anybody else in the film. It was fine, but the movie just wasn't very good. It wasn't a very good story. The visual effects weren't all that great. It felt very sloppy, had a very weird ending, and also a very predictable movie at the same time. But ultimately, really, what happened to the sequel? The first one happened. That's what happened. To the, the, what killed the sequel was the first one. The fact that it lost money and there was no reasonable expectation to think that if we make another one, it'll do better. There was no reason to believe that. And so ultimately that's what happened. But again, if you liked it, that's great. And cherish that. Hold on to that. There, there are movies that other people hate that I like. Hell, I like Armageddon. So there you go. You and me. So hold on to that. That's awesome. But ultimately, that's what happened to the movie. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Christopher O'Neill, who writes, my question to you is this, what film critic or pundit or group of critics slash pundits inspired you to join the business? Thanks and keep up the great work. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Christopher. I appreciate that. Um, here's the really interesting thing about it. Like a lot of people assume that when I made the jump, I was working in law at the time and I, I worked in, you know, civil construction for a while. I worked in the visual effects industry for a while. But when I made the move in 2013, well, I didn't make the full-time move, but when I started up in 2013, that's when I started the movie blog. I mean, it was June of 2013 is when I started the movie blog. Anyway, a lot of people assume, understandably so, that I was really inspired by certain film critics or whatever to get into doing this. And while I certainly grew up watching guys like Roger Ebert, while I certainly grew up watching guys like Leonard Moulton, who is still in the business today, and I, I still get a little starstruck when I'm at press screenings and Leonard Moulton's there. I'm like, but I've never had the guts to go up and speak to him. It's weird. I've gone up to, and spoken to the biggest f stars in the world, but I'd be sitting in a movie theater with Leonard Moulton. Leonard Moulton and Weird Al Yankovic. Those are the two celebrities that I have never had the guts to go up to and talk to, even though I've seen them both multiple, multiple, multiple times in person. I have never had the guts to go up and speak to either one of them. Why? No idea. But anyway, there you go. Um, so while I've certainly been influenced by guys like Moulton, by guys like Roger Ebert and things like that, they weren't really my inspiration for getting into it. Honestly, 
the people that were the inspiration for me getting into it were actually sports broadcasters. When I started the movie blog, and ultimately the movie blog audio edition, the first movie podcast ever, by the way, there's an interesting bit of trivia for it. My show, the movie blog audio edition was the first ever movie based podcast. Um, anyway, when I started that, the, what really wanted, got me to wanting to do that was my love for sports and my love for sports broadcasters. And there were a couple of sports broadcasters in particular that really got me going. The biggest of which is a Toronto radio sports broadcaster. Actually, his, his show is broadcast nationally and internationally. But anyway, he was Toronto based is a guy by the name of Bob McCowan. And Bob McCowan was a sports broadcaster his whole career, but he was broadcasting on the big all sports talk radio station in Toronto called the Fan 590. I think they've changed their name now, but anyway, it's called Primetime Sports with Bob McCowan. And those of you who live in Canada, you might know exactly who I'm talking about. And actually, you know what? My greetings and salutations, I stole that from Bob McCowan. Now, Bob McCowan doesn't say it though. He doesn't go, greetings and salutations. Bob McCowan's more like, uh, greetings and salutations, everybody. That's more him. But I actually got my greetings and salutations from Bob McCowan. That's who I stole that from. And I just, I was a huge fan of the way, not just Bob, but sport. I loved, I wanted to bring, when I started doing film punditry, I wanted to bring the mentality and passion of a sports fan to movies. I wanted, because when me and my buddies would talk about movies, we wouldn't talk about movies as auteurs or talk about the art of it. We, we talked about it as fans, you know? And I quite, and I realized quite quickly that we talked about it like sports fans. We talked about movies the same way we talked about football. And when we talked, that's how we naturally talked. So I thought, wouldn't it be kind of refreshing to bring the way you naturally talk about something to a show because that's the way I talk about movies. I talk about movies like I'm a sports fan. So I thought I want to do a show about that. I want to do a website like that. I want to model it after that instead of modeling it after something else that a lot of other people are already doing and doing well. That's fine. I wanted to do my own thing. And so it was sports broadcast. But one of the coolest things, I think the biggest influence that a guy like Bob McCowan had on me uh, as a pundit was that Bob McCowan was a big fan of a lot of things. But Bob McCowan was never afraid to call out dumb shit, even involving the teams or personalities or organizations he loved. Like he could love a particular team or love a particular team president or general manager or player. He could be huge fans of them, but it would never stop him from calling out those teams, those organizations, those GMs, those presidents, those players, it would never stop him from calling out and calling a spade a spade, calling out dumb shit. When dumb stuff was done, he would call it out and call it dumb stuff. It never stopped him from being a fan, it never stopped him from loving those things. He just felt, and this is where I got this from, <clears throat> he felt if you're a real fan, for instance, of the Toronto Maple Leafs, just talking about, right? If you're a real fan of the Toronto Maple Leafs, you should be the most loud and most vocal critic of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Because if you don't, that means you don't really care about them enough to want to see them get better. And that was his thing. And I remember that echoed so true with me. And you'll notice, like, I'm a huge, I mean, you can see all my DC shit I got around here, but I, I'm a huge DC movie fan, huge. But that does, because I am a fan, that I will not stop or I will not hesitate to call out what I believe are stupid things being done or incorrect things being done by Warner Brothers or DC, be not in spite of the fact or despite the fact that I'm a fan of Warner Brothers and DC, it's because I'm a fan of Warner Brothers and DC. You know, when I talk about like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., right? I don't like call out how bad I think that show is despite the fact that I'm a big Marvel fan. No, it's because I'm a big Marvel fan that I will call out bad product like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., like Iron Fist, like Jessica Jones. I have to call it out because I love the Marvel brand and I love Marvel and Disney and I love what they do. And so I will be their biggest cheerleader, but I will also be their biggest critic. And that was one of the big lessons I learned from a guy like Bob McCowan. Now, I have never had the pleasure or honor of meeting Bob McCowan. And maybe some of you guys watch and listen to Bob McCowan. Hell, maybe some of you know Bob McCowan. Put in a word for me. I would, I would love, it would be a bucket list thing for me to meet Bob McCowan because he has really influenced my career a lot. And him and a number of other sports broadcasters as well. But I think the chief among them was a Bob McCowan. And those are the lessons that I learned from him that I try to bring into talking about movies. And I know 
that the lessons I learned from Bob McCowan rub some people the wrong way. Some people think, well, if you're a fan of something, John, that means you never say anything bad about it. Pfft, that's fake fandom. To me, that's totally fake fandom. John, if you're a fan of Marvel, you should never say something bad about one of their marquee TV shows. Fake fan, fake fan. Um, and I know that drives a lot of people crazy. And that's fine. As long as you're being, dri being driven crazy, and as long as you hate me, and as long as all that kind of stuff, because of my honest feelings on something, if you hate me because I'm being honest, and if you hate me because I'm saying what I truly think and believe, and if you hate me because I'm saying something that I believe is true, and I'm saying it because I love the property and I want to be better, if you hate me for those reasons, I can live with that. I can live with that. And it's my job here. I've said this before. I'll say it again. It is not my job to say what people agree with. And that's another lesson I learned from Bob McCowan. It is not my job as a pundit to say things that people agree with. I am not in the getting people to agree with me business. It is my job. I've said this before. I will say it again. I will always say this. It is my job to tell you what I honestly think and tell you why I think it so that you as the viewer or listener it can help you properly identify, sharpen, and define why you agree with me or why you disagree with me. See, if me explaining my position in such a way helps you better clearly understand why you disagree with me, awesome, my job's done. Then I feel great about that. If me expressing my opinion and my beliefs and the reasoning behind my opinions makes you agree with me, Great, I'm equally happy, but I don't care if it's one or the other. All I want is it to be helping you understand why you disagree with me, helping you understand why you agree with me. As long as that happens, then I'm happy. Anyway, uh, we went on that for a while. Let's move on to the final question of the day, which comes to us from Jorge Luis Martinez, who writes, Movie reviewers say that movies should be judged on their own merits as movies. But with Batman versus Superman, they are quick to judge Batman because of his no-kill rule which the movie doesn't establish. Isn't that unfair? It's like Man of Steel. It was judged based on previous iterations of the character, but not the movie itself, which is an adaptation. Shouldn't movies be judged on their own merits and the universe that the movie establishes and its own context? What are your thoughts? A frickin' men, brother. A frickin' men. It would drive me insane whenever I hear people whine and complain. That movie sucked because Batman shouldn't kill people. Since when? Guess what? This isn't the comic book. This isn't the comic book. This is the movie. And in this universe and, and world, it never says Batman has some archaic, I can't ever do anything that might risk the life of a villain. Never done. Never said in this universe. Within the context of this world, this is Batman. Sure, you've got your Batman from the 1960s. Sure, you got your Batman from the 1980s and 1990s movies as well. You got your Batman from this and your Batman for that. This isn't those Batman. This is this Batman, all right? This is this Batman. And this Batman, when murderers have machine guns pointing at him, trying to kill him. Hey, if if in the process of taking them out, they die, that's on them. I mean, nobody winds up. Do you know how many people the Avengers murder in the first, that first scene of Avengers Age of Ultron? You know, when Scarlet Witch accidentally blows up the building. I'm not talking about the blowing up the building. I'm talking about how many of the bad guys they kill. Do the body count. They kill a lot of people. Yeah, but John, they don't have a rule about not killing people. Guess what? Neither does this Batman. Neither does this Batman. And it would drive me crazy. And I absolutely agree with the question. It's like, judge the movie on its own merits. Judge the movie in and of itself. Evaluate the movie in and of itself. Leave your baggage about what you think the movie should be at the door. Evaluate the movie for what it is, not for what you think it should be. Not for your biases and your predispositions. Not for your pre-existing notions and ideas about what this character is supposed to do and supposed to be. How about you leave all that garbage at the door and just go in and watch the movie and then evaluate the movie on its own merits? In this universe, Batman doesn't have, at least not yet, Batman doesn't have an absolutely nobody can ever die rule. He doesn't. Sorry. Yeah, in the comic book he does, but in the movie he did not. Well, he should... Forget your stupid should-haves. I, I coulda, shoulda, woulda. 
All right. Just evaluate the movie. Notes. And I believe like, hey, all film is subjective. You watch the movie for whatever reason you didn't like it. Totally cool. That's the awesome thing about film is that each of us can love or hate different movies for different reasons or different criteria. That's great. But what would drive me crazy is people who, who make up this excuse about an external thing that had nothing to do with the movie. Like this issue that has nothing to do with the movie and they're judging the movie based on that issue that has nothing to do with the movie. That would drive me crazy. You know, I say Batman, this is like the best Batman I think we've ever had on screen. Can't possibly be the best Batman we've ever had on screen because he killed people. Guess what? In this universe, he does. So evaluate it on that basis, not on the basis of some antiquated thing that Batman had in the comic book starting way back in 1921 or whatever year it was. I mean, that's the part that would drive me crazy. So it's like, if you didn't like Batman versus Superman, that's cool. I got no problem with that. That's, that's awesome. I'm sure I don't like some movies that you like and we can all still be friends. That's great. I just hated this notion of because of this. And it goes the same for Man of Steel when a lot of people would say, well, this isn't the Superman I grew up with. Well, because the Superman you grew up with was created in the context of the 1940s and the 1930s. This is a story, this is a movie telling the story about a Kryptonian coming to Earth in 2000 and whatever it was, 2014, 2013, whatever. That's the context in which Man of Steel exists. So obviously this Man of Steel is in a different world. He's in a different reality. He's in a different context than that Superman comic book you read back in 1978. It's a different context. Judge the movie on its own merits because I believe if you judge Man of Steel on its own merits, you'll see it's a pretty freaking masterful movie. Anyway, so yes, I do completely agree with you. I I get really frustrated when people saying, that character is supposed to have brown hair, not black hair. This character is supposed to have blue eyes, not off blue eyes. This character is supposed to do this, and this character is supposed to do that, and this, suppose, 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 suppose. Says who? Says who? Just watch the movie. See what artistic interpretation that the directors bring, and then love it or hate it based on what they presented, not based on did they meet my checklist of supposed. Supposed to do this, supposed to do that, supposed to do this, supposed, 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 supposed. Duh! Supposed is the enemy of good art. Supposed to is the enemy of good movie making. Now, that doesn't mean every movie's good. Most movies are shit. We know this. But it's not because they didn't check out the right supposed boxes. Just go in and watch the movie and evaluate on its own merits. Anyway, you, you just triggered me a little bit. Congratulations. Anyway, that'll do it for me, guys, for today's installment of the John Campion Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, if you want an audio-only version of the podcast, become one of my Patreon supporters. We do put up an audio-only version of the podcast on my Patreon page every day for my supporters, so go on over and check that out. Also, make sure while you're here, click on the subscribe button. Become a subscriber to my John Campia YouTube channel here and check out all the videos I do every day. I do like 70 to 90 videos every single month, so make sure you keep up to date on that. That'll do it for me, guys. Thanks so much for joining me. And until next time, bye-bye.